Y'all clock this tea. There once was a woman in the 70s, 80s, and part of the early 90s who was using voodoo and all of its magical properties for every other thing than what it was supposed to be for. Okay? She was getting away with crimes. I'm not talking about little crimes. I'm talking about murder, incest, fraud, all the horrible, disgusting shit that you don't even want to think about, right? And it worked up until a certain point when I suspect her spirit team, the said spirits assisting her, were sick. Did y'all just see that? Or, sorry, we're sick of her shit. Get your popcorn. This is, get your gourmet popcorn. This is chef's kiss. Hi, I'm Noah, and I'm a spooky spiritualist, and on my channel, we talk about death, true crime, spiritual reparations, haunted people, places, and things, and how you can F around and find out. If you are not subscribed to my channel, I highly recommend that you do so, and while you're at it, turn your notification bell on. Before we start today's video, I just want to sincerely thank all of you guys, the people from TikTok, that was my family, everybody that are my new subscribers here. Y'all have been blowing this page up. And from the bottom of my heart, I truly feel nothing but love and gratitude. And I wish the same for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So on today's episode of The Reckless, we have Josephine Gray. She was born in 1946 in Maryland. Little is known about Josephine's early life. We do know from court documents that she did have a little bit of trauma in her early life and that she was a very flamboyant, very just, she was that girl. She dressed to the nine, she looked good, she smelled good, and she always kept her a bag, okay? She also kept her a man. We don't ever know of a time in Josephine's early teen years, adult lives where she was single. Sis- always kept a man. And although she was this big personality, she seemed to love quiet, very reserved men. And it is said later on that she liked those type of quiet men so she could control them. And I mean, make them do whatever she wanted down to leaving their wives, abandoning responsibilities. <laughs> we'll get there. But when I tell you every man that crossed paths with her, and that was in a relationship with her, bowed to her knees. It was almost weird how dedicated these men were to her. In 1967, at the age of 21, Josephine married her first husband. His name was Norman Stibling. They had five children together during their marriage. And their marriage was full of drama, to say the least. This was not a happy marriage, y'all. She worked for the Montgomery County public school system and she was a janitor there and she stayed with that company for quite some time, her whole adult life, pretty much. Sometime in the 1970s, Josephine took a part-time job cleaning offices where she met a man by the name of Robert Gray. His name actually was William Robert Gray, but he went by Robert. He was in his early 30s. He was already married and he had six children at home depending on him. Up until he met Josephine, everybody said that Robert was a doting husband and father. Everything seemed on the up and up for Robert and his family until he met Josephine. Those closest to Robert during this time said that they seen a substantial shift in Robert's behavior and how he was just acting, moving. His day-to-day -day was super weird compared to the Robert that they had known for so many years. His wife, whose name was Frances, even commented that she suspected that Josephine was putting stuff in Robert's food at this time to alter his behavior. AKA, this woman believed that Josephine was conjuring, doing love spells, doing domination spells on Robert to keep him from his family and his regular life. 
because not only was he ignoring his wife and children and had been very out with this affair that he was having with Josephine, he had totally like abandoned his kids as well, which was totally out the norm for Robert at this time. It had gotten so deep with the suspected conjuring that Josephine was allegedly putting on Robert that once he stopped eating her food, he would go around his wife and kids and act like the Robert that they known. It was absolutely bizarre. This is where the whole rumor that she was doing spells on Robert even became a thing because it's not like Robert just was the same like character during this affair. No, he was at, he was acting absolutely weird and different and withdrawn and all that other mystery, like weird stuff. Additionally, Robert was telling family and friends about the things that he had seen in Josephine's house. For instance, that she had a lot of powders, herbs, potions in her bedroom that was hidden off where the public eye wouldn't be able to see unless they came into her room. So it was a lot of just weirdness going on. And like I said, his personality will return whenever he has spent time away from Josephine, but it went right back to that weirdness, that distance that he put between himself and all of his family and friends whenever he was underneath her. While all this is happening, Josephine is still married to Norman. You know, the first guy that we talked about. Keep up. There's a lot of men in this story. She's still married to Norman. And Norman has begun telling his family and friends that he was becoming increasingly afraid for his life. Because he had seen his name in spell jars and conjurings. Right? He's seen his name in her spells. And not only that, one night he woke up to Josephine standing over him with a gun and she pulled the trigger and the gun misfired. I don't know if he is just lucky or if he should have acted quicker, but all the red flags were there that Josephine was attempting to unalive her husband, Norman. Norman was able to escape that time. But on March 4th, 1974, police found his body in a car in Gaithersburg, okay? But the weirdest part about this is that his body was in the driver's seat. They had seen that he had been smoking cigarettes, almost like he was conversing with someone that he knew that was familiar to him because there was like a little pile of cigarette butts right next to his car. He had sat there for some time. This absolutely seemed like this was someone that Norman knew that did this to him. He was way too comfortable in his car and with the cigarette butts sitting right there. This was like a long winded conversation he was having with someone. Police initially suspected that Norman's murder was a robbery gone bad because there was some things at the crime scene that made police think that this could have been a robbery, right? That is until a couple of weeks later, two witnesses or people came into the police station and said that weeks prior to Norman's murder, Josephine had approached them and offered them $5,000 to murder Norman. This lady was out here doing what she considered the good Lord's work, but she was about to fuck around and find out. Police then arrested Josephine and Robert. Okay, they arrested them. They thought they had them in the bag. That's until their two witnesses who had walked into the police station weeks before dropped off the face of the earth. Because word around town was that Josephine was doing conjuring spells, rituals to keep witnesses away or at bay. So of course, with no witnesses, they had to release Robert and Josephine. After Norman's death, Josephine received about $15,000 in life insurance policies. Okay, and that's about eighty-five dollars to $100,000 
in today's age. And this woman used this money to have a lavish wedding and marry Robert Gray. The psychopathness, that's not a word, I just made it up, of all of this is diabolical. It is just crazy. She also used the money to put a down payment on a house for her and her new husband. They did have a baby. This was Josephine's sixth and Robert's seventh and their only shared child. But even this marriage wasn't happy. It wasn't a peaceful home. There was a lot of arguing, fighting, different things like that. His personality still was messed up. Robert was going through the motions and it didn't get any better. Josephine volunteered to take on her cousin. Her cousin Clarence was an adolescent who is from New York, Brooklyn, I believe. And he is having a hard time getting mixed up in trouble. So Josephine volunteers to take Clarence in under her wing to try to keep him from this bad life that he was going down. He was going down the wrong path. He was a troubled teen. And this was in the mid 1980s. Okay, so they have been married for some time at least two to three years at this point. And the disgusting part about this portion of the story is that Clarence's parents trusted Josephine to take care of Clarence, to raise him up right and to protect him because he was getting in so much trouble in Brooklyn that they were like, if we don't get this boy out of here, he's not gonna make it here in Brooklyn, New York. And she did the complete opposite. It is said in the late 80s, she began having spicy time with Clarence. They were kissing cousins. It also is said she was grooming him, doing everything that a predator would do to get a old teenager, as I like to call him, or young adult to trust her literally grooming this little boy who was a blood family member. This was not a like play cousin. This was her cousin all during this time. She's still married to Robert. So she's sleeping with her cousin and her husband still lives in the house. And just like the previous lover, I mean, it's a pattern at this point, things get really, really bad between Josephine and Robert. She even chased him around the house with a gun and he had to jump out of a second story window and run to his parents' house who lived just down the street. It was getting bad. Robert was also telling the people around him the same things that Norman told people around him that he felt like Josephine was trying to kill him, was trying to poison him, all of the, the conjuring stuff. He was afraid for his life, okay? He was afraid at this point because she had found Robert's new replacement in her cousin Clarence. It was totally out of control. And remember, Robert and Josephine were arrested for the murder of Norman. So Robert was already very aware of what Josephine did to her past lovers. I mean, he knows about the spiritual work. He knows about the voodoo. He knows all of her deepest, darkest secrets. And at this point, bruh is scared. I don't even blame him for being scared. Because one thing I did forget to mention is whenever prior to like a couple of weeks before Norman even was found killed in his car, he was scratching his face to shreds and that's why people suspected something not only because we all know that she was doing voodoo but she was also making him lose his mind so at this point he's thinking about what him and her probably conjured up for norman and didn't want to fuck around and find out and be her next victim josephine had a rage that was just uncontrollable in August of 1990, this lady literally went up to Robert's job and attacked him with a knife and a baseball bat. And at that point, Robert was like, I had enough. This lady is too unhinged for me. So he pressed charges against 
Josephine Gray. Robert and Josephine had a hearing for the attack that Josephine did on him at his job. And this pissed Josephine off to the highest pissivity that he had even brought these charges against her. So a little bit of time passed after the hearing, which was October 5th, 1990. And Robert is driving down the street. And in his rear view, he sees Josephine following him, aggressively following him, very close behind him, following him. And so she pulls up on the side of him. They make eye contact. And then he looks. And then who's in the passenger seat? Who? Clarence, her cousin that she's sleeping with. He leans forward and points a gun at Robert. Robert somehow, some way manages to get away, but Robert also went to a police station and talked to a detective about this encounter. At this point, he was shook because like I said, she's doing the same thing to Robert that she did to Norman with her new lover. All the while, Josephine cannot be held down, okay? Josephine starts an affair with somebody else behind Clarence and Robert's back. Now, once all of this went down with Robert and Clarence and him being, you know, basically threatened and almost unalived, he rented an apartment. He moved out like he was done. He was working with police to try to basically get Josephine behind bars. He also started changing the beneficiaries on his life insurance policies because sis was about a bag. She was all about the money. All of this was rooted with prosperity in all the wrong ways. So he starts moving around his business affairs, taking her off of policies, making sure she had nothing to gain from him dying. Okay. And he had a party at his house, his new apartment. And his kids are adults at this point. And one of his kids commented that the, the spell is finally broken because now that Robert was off on his own and totally disconnected from Josephine, he was back to his old self. His personality, his luster came back. And it's just so weird and coincidental. Isn't it ironic that once he's not around her eating her food, that he's coming back to okay he became a doting father again like i said his kids were grown at this point so they were very happy that they had gotten their dad back but of course in true josephine gray fashion she couldn't let that celebration and that happiness last very long less than a week later after the celebration at his apartment robert gray was found shot dead and this was like seven days before they were due back in court, him and Josephine. Coincidence? I think the fuck not. He was found in the doorway of his apartment. He had gone off work, went home like he usually does, and someone was in his apartment waiting for him. And they shot him. And next to his body on a table was a business card from the detective that he was working with to try to take Josephine down. Senseless. And to make matters worse, his body was found by his dad and a friend of his that was worried about him because of this whole drama with Josephine. It was a tragic end for Robert Gray, but it was also a lesson in karma because he had done this exact thing to Norman Stibling. Remember that. Okay, he did not deserve to die. Neither one of them deserved to die. But at the same time, everything that goes around is going to come back around. It took police six months of investigating the murder of Robert Gray, and they weren't really getting anywhere. They suspected Josephine, but there was not enough evidence to place her at the crime or to book her for murder. And then out of nowhere, two of Josephine's children came forward and told the police, I think my mama is responsible for this. It's giving that my mom did this. Even her kids were like, 
over it. Okay? The child that she shared with Robert came forth. And then one of the children that was not Robert's came forth and said that they believe that Josephine was 100% responsible for Robert's murder. You got to be a cold piece of work for your own kids to be tired of your shit and say, I'm about to snitch because this is, this is ridiculous. It's getting out of control because don't forget that even though one of the children that came to police was not Robert's, they belong to Norman who also was murdered or allegedly at this point murdered by Josephine and one of her lovers. It's safe to say that everybody was tired of the shenanigans that Josephine Gray was partaking in because even her brother and another one of her kids came forward. They were tired, child. They were tired of death surrounding Josephine and nobody doing anything about it because there wasn't enough evidence or there wasn't enough something. They were sick of it. Josephine is in jail, okay? And then she makes bond. She bails herself out. And though we have all of these witnesses that are like, yeah, she did it. All of them began recanting their statements. They are afraid because they know that she's dabbling in voodoo. They know that she will kill them. And so her brother, her children, one by one, started recanting and just being like, you know what? I, actually, never mind. I was just playing. Psych. So there, once again, it is this whole, like, we don't have any evidence to convict this woman for a murder charge. And it's also said that she was doing protection spells, rituals, all of that good stuff. She was working with magic during this time to make sure that she stayed out of jail. That's allegedly, y'all. Y'all know I'm a spiritualist and I'm sensitive and serious about my shit. But that's what T is. Unbeknownst to Josephine, people were putting the police up on game on why they suspected she was never convicted for any of these murders, right? And the police came out and just asked her, do you practice voodoo? And this is what Josephine had to say. She called the whole act absurd, like, oh, this is just so ridiculous. And then she went on to say, I don't practice no voodoo and I do not practice witchcraft. Be fucking for real. Following up, and I'm just loosely recanting what she said, just because I buy charms and herbs does not make me a voodoo practitioner. Those are in the Bible. Now, I know I have Christian viewers and herbs absolutely are in the Bible. But if you mix them together and you're a Christian, it's called blasphemy, necromancy. Come on now. Let's be for real. Let's be all the way for real. She was totally denying all of this voodoo mumbo jumbo, but it was said by many people that the reason why her witnesses would back out is either that she did a, a conjuring or a ritual, a voodoo conjuring or ritual, or people were just genuinely afraid of her because of her practices. Prosecutors were not convinced. They were not buying it. They knew absolutely already that Josephine was a voodoo practitioner. And so what they did was get a warrant to tap phone calls between Josephine and a voodoo priestess. And the reason why they were able to obtain this wiretap is because a voodoo priestess came to the police and let them know, hey, I've been doing readings and consultations with Josephine Gray, and she's approached me about killing her husband. This woman was absolutely concerned. And so they tapped the phone. They got the information that they needed to get. They finally felt like they were going to nail Josephine. And then Rosie drops off the face of the earth like the other witnesses gone. They have no 
evidence. Her testimony would have been very like instrumental in convicting Josephine and she was gone. In 1991, prosecutors had announced that they were gonna drop all charges against Josephine for Robert's murder, but they were absolutely going to prosecute her for Norman's murder 17 years earlier. And it wasn't that they dropped the charges because they didn't believe that she did this. They absolutely believed she did this, but they were acting strategically because they wanted to reserve the right to retry her for Robert's murder at another time. Meaning that they hoped that some of these witnesses came back because every witness in the last like 20, 17 to 20 years, had literally like backed out or disappeared. So they wanted to reserve that right. They didn't want to like try her for Robert and lose because double jeopardy was a thing. You cannot retry someone for the same crime twice. But then once again, spirit was spiriting for this lady. I don't know what she was doing. I mean, she ran off a whole voodoo priestess, but the charges against Josephine for Norman's murder were dropped because their key witness or witnesses disappeared or backed out. And to make matters even worse, it was revealed during this time that though Robert had moved his affairs over, Josephine still received over $50,000 when he died at her hand. With this money, she paid off the house that she purchased with her previous husband's life insurance policy from Norman Stibling, the house that she bought with the $15,000, she paid that off with the life insurance policy she got from Robert Gray. And all of this was revealed during this trial or during this time when they were trying to take her to trial and during this time she's still with Clarence her cousin and she's having a outside affair with someone else and during this time there was issues with Josephine and Clarence Clarence claimed that she was trying to isolate him was doing magic on him it's the pattern for me. Did you think that she was going to be above everybody else just because you were her cousin? For one, you're sleeping with your cousin. You're sleeping with someone who dabbles in what could be considered the occult. You're sleeping with someone that is dangerous, that unalives all of her lovers. So it was so bad that she was controlling Clarence like she did the rest of them. Like none of the men were allowed to have keys to the house. Neighbors report seeing Clarence banging on the door and all that other stuff to try to get let in by Josephine. Okay. There was a situation where Josephine and her new boo, not Clarence, was having spicy time. And Clarence could hear the spicy activities happening in the next room and spaz the fuck out. It was a lot going on. But one thing Clarence knew at this time is that he was on the outs. That he was up next. So he moved out. He had started a life outside of Josephine's house. Had a baby and all that great stuff, right? And then he too was about to fuck around and find out like the previous husbands had found out. So Clarence, he moves out, he gains a little independence, he gets a job. Remember, this is a young boy. I mean, he was an adult, but a child for real, for real, like a young, young, young adult, early 20s, young adult. So he goes, he gets a job, he didn't have a baby. He's trying to get his life together. He worked for Loomis, which is like those armed security trucks that carry money. And he signed up for his benefits like everybody else that gets a job. But he made the mistake of letting the policy, his life insurance policy, lapse. Meaning that whenever back then, whenever your life insurance policy 
lapse, you only have 60 days of coverage. Okay. So in Josephine's head, we got to work overtime. We got to hurry up and get him out the picture. Josephine was the beneficiary on that too. This woman was doing all kind of spells and conjurings and all that stuff on all of these men to make them do what she wanted them to do. It was very weird. The hold that Josephine Gray had on all the men in her life. So she was trying to hurry up and get rid of Clarence so she could collect this life insurance policy. On June 21st, 1996, police found an abandoned car and there was a stench a minting from this abandoned car in Baltimore. It was dumped in the most roughest part of Baltimore at the time. And when police went to go look at the car, they recognized the stench as the stench of death, AKA a decomposing body. So they automatically open up the car and their Clarence is the, the young adult who was a child, a minor who was sent to Josephine to take care of, to cultivate into a young man, a responsible young man. But instead she unalived him and put him in the trunk of his own car. She also made it appear like it was a drug deal gone wrong, pinning a bag of snow to the inside of his underwears, which was her worst mistake because that looked very weird. It looked very much so weird. Who's pinning a bag of snow to the inside of their underwears? Nobody. It didn't appear right to the police. Prior to Clarence's body being found, he had a phone conversations with his sister about how he had became very afraid of Josephine. He had been telling everyone that was in his life that was important to him for weeks that this lady was crazy and that he was afraid that she was going to kill him. Literally telling people, this woman, if anything happens to me, it was this woman. He also told his sister that he was meeting up with Josephine a couple of hours before they found his body. Once again, old Josephine eludes police. There's no real evidence that was her, even though they suspect it. And she receives $100,000 which is a lot of money in our time. This was 1996, y'all. Receives $100,000 from Clarence's life insurance policy. Just crazy. The police and everyone around Josephine, it had appeared that she was getting away with murder for like the third time. And so police was like, we need a new strategy. So... They reached out to Josephine Gray's sneaky link. His name was Andre Savoy and he had no clue. She was in like a whole relationship with this man. And I called him a sneaky link because this is the man that she was cheating on Clarence and technically Robert, maybe cheating on Clarence for sure with, okay. This is the man that was having spicy time with Josephine and it enraged Clarence and he was not the type like police did not suspect him of anything like any wrongdoing they literally said this man Andre is not even capable of doing this he had no idea about the other people before him he had no idea about Clarence um Norman or Robert so he was the perfect person to go to because the same thing was happening. The same pattern that Josephine had been doing with all of her other victims was happening with Robert. The control, the isolation, the alienation, all of that was happening. People also reported seeing Andre out on his own porch, the porch he shared with Josephine 
banging on the door to get in, just like they had seen Clarence and just like they had seen Robert do previously. He also was not allowed to have his own money like the previous men. He was in danger and didn't even realize it. So, of course, once the prosecution team reached out to Andre, Andre was like, absolutely, I will help. And so that he did. He placed bugs throughout Josephine's home. <laughs> this man was brave. <laughs> he placed them throughout the house to help prosecutors get Josephine. But the hard part about all of this was that anything that didn't have anything to do with a murder that was recorded, they had to stop recording. But the prosecutors heard some very interesting things on those tapes. They heard Josephine doing spells, okay? She was hexing the prosecutor, the judge, the detective. She had placed spells on all of these people's heads. And they were listening to them being hexed. Unhinged. I don't care. This woman was unhinged. Josephine had also made a new friend in this time and they went on vacation together and they were in the hotel room and she brought her new friend into her portion of the hotel room, right? Where her bed was and all her belongings was. And there was a bunch of newspaper clippings out on her bed about all the murders of all the men that she had dealt with and also how they could not seemed to nab Josephine. So her new friend, who by the way was a witness that really did not want to be involved. They just like subpoenaed her. She was mad as hell. So she made the perfect witness because she didn't want to be involved. And she did not come to the police on her own recognizance. They grabbed her. So they're in this hotel room. She sees all these newspaper articles that have Josephine and her dearly departed in them and so josephine sits there and brags about how she unalived these men and got away with it and credits voodoo in the spirits for helping her <laughs> this woman was about to find out what happens when you are given too much grace it gets good. So it's also rumored that she was still doing practices and they were working, but her luck was about to run out because in November of 2001, yes, you heard me right, 2001, some of these unalivings happened in the 70s. She was convicted of mail and wire fraud under Marilyn Slayer's rule. And the reason why she was convicted of this is because she collected the life insurance policies on Clarence, Norman, and Robert when she was the one who actually unalived them. The fact that it took this long for them to even bring charges on this lady is insane to me, but... I digress. And this time prosecutors have figured out there was a pattern with her witness intimidation. So they held her without bond because they wanted to get her. They want to nail her on these charges. And in true gray fashion, she calls Andre, who she's still like connected to, and tells him to plead the fifth in a threatening tone like, you better plead the fifth or else. She was just so confident that this was, this was just going to disappear like the other things. In 2006, she was convicted of the fraud part for collecting the life insurance. It wasn't for the murders of Norman, Clarence, and Robert. So even yet and still, she never really saw her true day in court and got the reparation, the spiritual reparations that she probably should have. Um, in 2006, she tried to appeal it and they upheld the original verdict. They were going, they're going to make her sit down because they can't prove anything about the other murders because of the intimidation and 
all that other stuff. You know, they even, they went through her house during this. They found voodoo dolls, aka poppets, with human hair. She was in there doing a lot. And I feel like the spirits were just like, "Mm, you may need to learn this lesson, sis. And she absolutely did. She deserved more than what she got. So she should just be lucky that it was only 40 years. But they did this on purpose because by the time that that 40 year sentence would have been fully served, she'll be in her 90s. This was a life sentence for her. So there's that. All in all, my opinion of this case is that, and as this is me as a spiritualist, um, she was definitely doing something. You do not get that many lucky breaks with that many murders and that much dirt on your hands. Is it fair? No. I don't believe that the victims deserve to be spell ridden or bound. This is what happens whenever you get one ritual that works. And then you want to do a bunch of other ones, okay? The Most High is going to let you do this. But are you ready for the consequences? My best advice for this is, fellas and ladies, if you get a partner that insists on you getting a life insurance policy and they're adamant about them being the beneficiary and them only being the beneficiary, even if you have children, run, don't walk. That is red flag number one. Y'all do good, be good. And if you have a story that you would like me to cover, please leave it in the comments. I will try my best to get to all of them. Y'all be safe. 